This is the presentation that we put on during the April 2014 Electric Flight Symposium held in Santa Rosa, California by the CAFE Foundation. The title of our presentation is Affordable Flight for All and Introducing the EMG-6. Your narrator for this reproduction of this presentation is Brian Carpenter. As an introduction about myself, my name is Brian Carpenter and along with my wonderful wife Carol we own and operate Rainbow Aviation Services and its subsidiary company Adventure Aircraft LLC. I am a commercial instrument rated flight instructor and sport pilot examiner with over 8,000 hours in more than 300 different type aircraft and ultralight. I hold an airframe and power plant certificate with an inspection authorization and a light sport repairman certificate for airplane weight shift, powered parachute and glider. This is a result of Rainbow Aviation being the primary provider for light sport repairman maintenance training throughout the United States with more than 3,000 students now having attended our classes. I'm a designated airworthiness representative for experimental as well as light sport aircraft. Some of the aircraft I've previously built are shown on this slide and the prototype EMG-6 that we're going to be talking about in these slides is aircraft build number 43. Along with Carol, we have co-authored two books, A Professional Approach to Ultralights and Sport Pilot Airplane. In addition to being an aviation speaker presenting at most of the major air shows, we're also contributors on a regular basis to the EAA Home Builder Tip videos. We're a proud association with EAA fulfilling functions of flight advisor, technical counselor, as well as being past president and founder of Chapter 1148 in Corning, California. And in 2007, we were recipients of the United States Association's prestigious Moody Award for Excellence in Sport Aviation. So let me share my passion and my vision for saving the aviation community as a whole. We have this dilemma that's making the dream of flight for the average person almost unobtainable. The cost of flying itself doesn't have to be insurmountable, but we've got this problem. The collective cost associated with flying has reached a threshold of pain that preempts most would-be pilots from even beginning the process of participating in aviation. The cost of flight training, the cost of insurance, aircraft storage, fuel, maintenance, financing, medical, etc. But mostly it has become the cost of the aircraft that has put most people off from beginning the journey. We've seen a lot of changes in aviation over the past 20 years. One of the most significant changes to occur was the adoption of the light sport rule. Reducing costs associated with aviation were one of the primary goals when the light sport rule was adopted. And it has succeeded by significantly lowering the cost of aircraft certification and maintenance. The technology, innovation, and quality of these aircraft is really quite impressive, but as oftentimes happened, we've seen a divergence from what the original intent of the rule was to what we have today. The majority of aircraft being sold in the United States today as light sport aircraft have starting prices well over $100,000. For most would-be pilots, this entry-level price is a non-starter. Aircraft in this price range are normally reserved for that well-to-do pilot that had to move to light sport because of medical issues or for flight schools. Proof of that? FAA records show in 2012 only 259 SLSA aircraft sold and registered in the United States. We have to recognize that we have a need for a new paradigm that addresses the needs of that entry-level pilot that exists without a trust fund. On this slide, we're going to show our vision for addressing this dilemma of a high-cost entry-level aircraft. We believe that if we can provide an entry-level aircraft at a reasonable price, that like most of us involved in the aviation industry, those pilots that start off with the entry-level aircraft will eventually be bitten by the aviation bug and naturally transition onto a bigger aircraft with more pilot certificates and privileges. We have nine bullet points that we feel are the most important criteria necessary in order to be able to achieve this goal. First of all, the aircraft has to be capable of being built and flown as a legal Part 103 ultralight. Number two, electric powered, safe, fun, and easy to fly, good performance, folding wings, low cost, simplified construction, aesthetic design, and a marketable product. That being said, we would like to share our vision with you. Presenting the EMG-6.
First item on our bullet list is that the aircraft must incorporate the capability to be flown under Part 103 regulations. Although Part 103 regulations in itself is not the end goal for this aircraft, having a method by which we can allow a pilot to begin flying without the associated costs of receiving a full-blown pilot certificate or even a sport pilot certificate will provide a low-cost entry-level method into aviation. Currently, you could build the EMG-6 as an ultralight, begin flying under Part 103 regulations, later on convert the aircraft to an experimental amateur built aircraft under the 51% rule, thus allowing for upgrades to the aircraft providing greater endurance, more performance, carriage of passengers, or even multi-engine operations. The prototype EMG-6 is currently flying as a legal Part 103 aircraft. The aircraft has a 37-foot wingspan with 170 square feet of wing area. The gross weight on the aircraft is 750 pounds with an aspect ratio of 8.2 and a span loading of about 5.5 pounds at full gross weight. The current operating weight for all of the flight test is 522 pounds. Second item on the bullet list is electric power. If we look at the past ultralight problems to evaluate a vision forward for the future, we can see that all the problems that plague the ultralight industry with the two-stroke engines may be able to be solved with the use of electric power plants. The low reliability and the high degree of expertise required to operate and maintain a two-stroke engine successfully was nearly impossible. The high noise levels at low altitudes made the aircraft despised around populated areas, and the high maintenance costs, high fuel consumption, and low TBO simply made the two-stroke engines less than cost-effective. We can envision a day when pretty much anyone could operate a small, simple aircraft with electric power with extreme reliability and very little knowledge about the inner workings of the power plant system, all the time flying around nearly undetectable to the ear. Third item on the bullet list is safe and easy to fly aircraft. In retrospect, I believe that we should have added fun onto the list. As of the date of this PowerPoint presentation, all of the 51 flights that have been made so far were done by towing the aircraft aloft using a ground tow rig. In some cases, a 400cc Honda four-wheeler, as well as several other vehicles using a simple tow system inserted into the receiver hitch of that vehicle. At the Corning Airport, we have a runway that is 2,300 feet long, and we can extend off the end of the runway by as much as another 1,000 feet if needed. We use a 1,400-foot long tow rope and can typically get tow altitudes between 600 and 1,000 feet AGL. In this video, we are demonstrating the hands-off flight characteristics and show the stability of the aircraft. One of the many safety features that we've added into the aircraft to improve safety is the provisions built into the airframe for the installation of a BRS ballistic parachute system. In addition to that, the fuselage cockpit area is designed from 4130 chromoly steel with built-in rollover protection. One of the criteria associated with safety is speed. 
the higher the landing speed, the higher the risk. The EMG-6 sports a 37-foot wingspan and 174 square feet of wing area. This gives the EMG-6 a stall speed of only 23 miles per hour and with full flaps only 18 miles per hour. In the video we can see the third test flight of the aircraft in the glider configuration during landing. It has a very short rollout. This gives credence to the old joke about ultralights that if the landing gets too scary we can always get out and walk. Another safety feature that we built in the aircraft was the ability to install a set of training wheels. We originally installed these training wheels with a dual purpose. First, to be able to maneuver the aircraft on the ground, and second, to assist the beginner pilot with takeoff and landings. We soon learned that the takeoff and landing speeds were so slow that the training wheels were not needed at all, and after six flights we never flew with them again. During the initial single wheel operations, we had a wing runner that was working pretty aggressively to ensure that our wing remained level during the takeoff phase. It wasn't until we employed the help of a 14-year-old to help run wing that we realized just how little help was necessary. I really had no idea what was going on, the wing, going on at the wingtip until looking at the video, and since then we've been making launches without the help of a wing runner at all. The fourth item on our design criteria bullet list is good performance. The secret to good performance on the aircraft is by taking some very basic principles of design and applying them to the design goals of the aircraft while simultaneously recognizing the trade-offs. Ninety percent of the aircraft's performance comes from that first ten percent of design principles. The last ten percent of performance can be improved but equates to most of the cost of the aircraft. By accepting these trade-offs, we can create an aircraft that costs less than $20,000 rather than those aircraft that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce. Currently, we are flying the aircraft at about 550 pounds operating weight, and we've seen consistent glide ratios right around 13 to 1 and minimum sink right around 280 feet per minute. In this video, we're going to take a look at a typical flight. We'll get a chance to look at the onboard instrumentation and see what kind of performance parameters the aircraft is capable of. For this flight, we'll be ground launching using a Ford Bronco as a tow vehicle. During the initial part of the takeoff run, you can see that the aircraft has to level off momentarily. The reason for this is, is that the tow vehicle is a manual transmission, and during the process of shifting gears, the rope pressure goes to zero. Once the vehicle is transitioned into third gear, the remainder of the tow can be accomplished at 35 to 40 miles per hour. We have superimposed the airspeed indicator along with the variometer onto the screen so that we can get a closer look at what's really happening on board the aircraft. On today's flight, we will be launching from a field elevation of approximately 280 feet as can be seen on the variometer. We'll be towing to an altitude of approximately 600 feet above the ground. We have measured the rope pressure during a normal tow and we can correlate that with the information inside the aircraft to determine that when we're launching with 250 pounds of pressure on the rope we typically will see right around 1300 feet per minute rate of climb. So we have released from the tow line at an altitude of just at 610 feet above the ground. From this altitude, we're going to be able to fly the downwind, overfly the launch site, complete another 360 degree turn, and land in exactly the same spot that we took off from. Now this performance is under no circumstances comparable with that of any high performance glider, but rather a very reasonable 
glide ratio and sink rate that will make soaring capability very realistic. We envision that this performance with a small sustainer motor will make 15 to 30 minute flights achievable even on a day without any lift and do that all with a minimal power plant and minimal battery package. On a good day with thermals, the necessity for battery usage will be very minimal but remain available in the event that we need them. Maybe to transition over to another thermal or fly beyond what would normally be a safe distance away from the launch site all with the added safety of having that backup battery power to return back to the launch site should we not encounter any additional thermals. Additionally, the battery power will give us a good glide path control on approach to landing and the event that it's necessary we'll even have enough power to go around and try again. Number five on the bullet list for the design criteria is folding wings. And although folding wings in themselves are not an added feature when it comes to the performance or the flight characteristics of the aircraft, when we look at the overall success or failure of a design that relates primarily to the cost of operation, folding wings now become a significant value. Having the ability to fold the wings and trailer the aircraft to or from the airport can be a significant cost savings. We have designed the aircraft so that the tail folds completely without disconnecting any of the control systems and the ailerons on the wings have been designed with a quick disconnect feature along with the wing struts and the complete package is folded up into a configuration which is no more than 30 inches wide. Even if you're not trailing in the aircraft to and from the airport, the ability to fold the wings and put it in a garage or in a hangar with other airplanes becomes significantly easier with such a small footprint. Even better yet, the whole concept of even needing an airport to fly from becomes somewhat suspect. Imagine that your aircraft fits in your garage right alongside your motorcycle and your lawnmower. You roll the aircraft outside, unfold the wings, fix the tail, do your pre-flight, and fire up your nearly silent electric motor and self-launch off of the cul-de-sac in front of your house at 5 a.m. in the morning with a 100-foot takeoff roll, having no one been even aware that you've departed. Number six on the bullet list for the design criteria was low cost. As we've discussed throughout the presentation, cost has always been one of those primary driving forces behind the design goals for the aircraft. Even if the aircraft is the most wonderful flying machine that you've ever flown, if you can't afford to fly it, it really doesn't matter. We've always recognized that one of the underlying factors with keeping the cost of the aircraft reasonable is to design it simple and then use cost-effective construction methods and materials in order to accomplish the goals. One of the methods by which we can also reduce the cost is to provide plans to build portions of the aircraft, keeping the initial investment low and leveraging your own labor to reduce the overall cost. Kit built options include a standard basic kit for only $12,000, and a fast build kit requiring only 90 hours to assemble for $16,000. Item number seven on the bullet list of design criteria is simplified construction. The EMG-6 employs several different types of standard aircraft construction. From the proven ultralight tube and Dacron sail covered components to the 2024 T3 match drilled fuselage boom and the 4130 welded steel tube fuselage. For those interested in building more of the aircraft themselves, the 4130 steel tube fuselage frame can be manufactured simply using templates that can be cut out from paper printed on your home computer, wrapped around the tube, marked and cut to the specific shape. Even the manufacturing of fixtures to ensure proper tube positioning during the welding process can be downloaded on your home computer and cut out of plywood or MDF. All of the parts on the CNC match drilled fuselage boom assembly come pre-drilled and bent to exacting precision in kit form. Assembly of the fuselage boom can be completed in as little as four hours using stainless steel pop rivets. All of the components on the aircraft are manufactured from 3D model components, ensuring that any component on the aircraft that needs to be replaced 
will be an exact fit. Item number eight on the bullet list is an aesthetic design. There's not much more to say about this other than we think that we've got a very well balanced design with good clean lines. In addition to the basic aircraft, there will be optional components that can be added to the aircraft to make it look even better, including a myriad of carbon fiber fairings for all parts of the aircraft. These components can be added at the time of construction or added later as the budget permits. The design also has the capability to be partially or completely enclosed in the cockpit area. The last item on our bullet list in the design criteria is that the aircraft has to be a marketable product. When we say a marketable product, what we're really looking at is the totality of the design and how it fits into the needs of the current aviation marketplace. We have identified the necessity for reducing the cost of flying and how this airplane meets and exceeds those goals. By building this airplane primarily as a glider with a small power plant system, the initial investment can be rather small, providing many hours of enjoyment at a relatively low cost. We are currently working on validating the appropriateness of towing the EMG-6 with the standard category aircraft. Because of the 60 mile per hour max tow speed, there are many conventional aircraft that tow well within this speed range during a glider tow. Probably one of the more exciting areas for the EMG-6 is that we have a tow speed that is high enough that it could be towed aloft using an experimental light sport aircraft. There's over 6,000 ELSA and SLSA in the United States now that have operating limitations that allow them to be used for towing commercially. One of the other aspects of the aircraft that makes it a very marketable product is that it is in fact a two-place glider. Now with a 750 pound gross weight and two people on board that's going to eliminate a lot of batteries that you're going to carry with the airplane. But because of the ability to tow the aircraft aloft with so many aircraft for primary training and also for transition training for these pilots having a second seat available for this sole purpose provides a lot of options and a lot of opportunities. We have quite a few customers that are currently looking into the possibility of installing gasoline power plants. Because of the advancements in the model aircraft industry, there are many relatively large giant scale RC motors that exist and may work appropriately on this aircraft. Because of the modular power plant system, using one, two, or even three giant scale RC motors may make the aircraft performance quite impressive. Additionally, we know that the current state of electric power is limited by batteries and long duration flights would be much more suited for gasoline power plants. This presentation is an expanded version of the PowerPoint presentation presented during the 2014 Electric Flight Symposium in Santa Rosa, California, sponsored by the CAFE Foundation. For more information about the EMG, please log on to electricmotorglider.com and stay abreast of all of our current progress with both construction and flight testing by logging onto the progress blog page and following our updates.